Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for everyone who's joined. We're just giving you know a minute or so to allow all the participants uh, to join the webinar, and then we'll be starting shortly. All right, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Alice Salon. I wanted to thank you all for joining today's member webinar titled Still Shooting for the Moon, Updates on the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. So just to kind of start out with some housekeeping. So we encourage questions to be asked throughout the presentation. As a courtesy to our presenters, all attendees have been muted. Please utilize the Zoom Q&A box for questions you may have throughout the presentation. The chat function is also available for discussion throughout the talk. Questions will be read aloud during the last 10 minutes of the webinar. So before we kind of get to the slide, we do have two learning objectives. The first is to define the currently funded Inherited Cancer Moonshot projects. And the second is to outline the President's Cancer Panel Report closing gaps in cancer screening for all Americans. And today we're joined by our two speakers. So our first speaker is Dr. Alana Ram, and she is a licensed and certified genetic counselor with over 20 years focusing on the implementation of precision health genomics programs within healthcare systems, including implementation of universal Lynch syndrome screening, alternate genetic service delivery models, patient and provider understanding of genomics, and patient engagement. She holds a doctorate in health and behavioral science and co-founded and co-directs the dissemination and implementation community at Geisinger and is a passionate advocate and mentor for the integration of implementation science in genomics and precision health. Our second speaker is Heather Hampel. Heather is a professor in the Department of Medical Oncology and Therapeutics Research and Associate Director of the Division of Cancer Genomics at the City of Hope National Cancer Center. Her research focuses on Lynch syndrome and universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome. She has over 170 publications on the prevalence of Lynch syndrome among colorectal and endometrial cancer patients, the best testing protocols, cost effectiveness, and referral guidelines for cancer genetics. She was on the board of directors for the American Board of Genetic Counseling from 2006 to 2011, serving as president in 2009 and 2010. She is currently the secretary treasurer of the National Society of Genetic Counselors. And with that, I'm going to actually pass it over to our first speaker, Alana. Hi everyone, thank you, Alice. And thank you so much for having us here today. And so, um, as Alice said, I'm going to talk about um, the current Moonshot projects. And so what I'm going to do first is give a little um, update or background on the Cancer Moonshot Initiative um, and the originally funded projects and um, where we are right now with a lot of the funded work related to the Cancer Moonshot and where it's going, um, a little bit of where it's kind of going in the future and, and you can, um, uh, and, and the involvement of genetic counselors in that. So the moonshot that I'm talking about is, you know, this started back in uh, 2016 when then Vice President Biden uh, announced his mission to cure cancer or his cancer moonshot. 
Uh, and that turned into the Blue Ribbon Panel Report. And specifically, there is a part of that from a working group, the Precision Prevention and Early Detection Working Group, that um, recommended projects related to cancer genetic testing, specifically hereditary breast ovarian cancer and Lynch syndrome. And those recommendations were specifically calling to the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, and the National Institutes of Health to support research to develop, test, and implement evidence-based strategies to identify those at risk for inherited cancer syndromes and implement the appropriate clinical management. Um, and the, the ultimate goal of all of this research that they were proposing in this recommendation is so that we can develop effective cancer prevention and early detection approaches and implement them for individuals at high risk for inherited cancer to really improve those outcomes. Next slide, please. And so part of this recommendation also, as I said, was, was to the National Institutes of Health uh, to support this work. So what it meant was they actually did put some money behind this. And this is what we um, call the Moonshot Projects. And those do span from um, basic science, developing drugs, all of that to this translational space that I'm going to focus on, which is this um, uh, doing the work in the hereditary cancer syndromes and improving the health of those at risk for hereditary cancer. Next slide. And so in order to do this, the um, to meet that recommendation and find approaches to identify and care for individuals with inherited cancer syndromes, um, they wanted to increase case ascertainment for probands and at-risk relatives and optimize delivery of evidence-based services. And you can see the, the definition of what they considered the evidence-based services there. And so what NCI did is these, these are what we call the moonshot, the, the, the formal moonshot projects. Um, so they are around case ascertainment and follow-up care as well as communication and decision-making. And these were the two RFAs that were put out and um, well, technically four ROAs, RFAs in, in these two, two groups. For those of you who aren't who don't live in this world of, of grants and, and um, funding, RFA stands for request for applications. And what that means as opposed to some of the other acronyms that you may see in RFA means that the funding agency is saying, not only are we asking for applications around this, um, around this subject or in this area, but they're saying specifically, we will fund X number of projects or we are putting X number of dollars to this. So we are inviting applications for people to apply to receive those funds or be one of those, you know, one of the five projects that we are going to fund. So these are the specific calls for applications that were put out. They were put out specifically in case ascertainment, follow-up care and communication and decision-making for hereditary cancer. Um, but there is also larger pots of money for the cancer moonshot. Next slide, please. And so while these started out with, um, so one of my studies, the um, IMPULSE study, uh, implementing universal Lynch syndrome screening in multiple uh, healthcare systems, as well as the first, uh, that was funded under the Moonshot funds. And then the first um, one that was funded under the RFA, the Moonshot RFA for hereditary cancers, those two were funded around 2017. So remember it came out in 2016. Since then, we are now up to this Inherited Cancer Syndrome Collaborative, which is a little bit larger than just those 12 uh, moonshots that were funded, plus the impulse study. We're now up to 22 studies with 38 investigators. Um, and the last three under this, what, what is called the NCI Research Project Grants, um, which is how Impulse is funded. Those are your traditional R01s. Investigators say, hey, I have this, this great idea. Um, and then NCI decides it, it gets funded out of um, the Moonshot funds or it belongs as part of this Inherited Cancer Syndrome Collaborative. Um, three of those Moonshot um, type grants, um, the R01s, three of those nine have been funded in the last uh, year or two, so since fiscal year 21. 
And then there's one PCORI uh, project that is also in this mix, um, in this collaborative that focuses on family history. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about what those um, projects cover and how you can see how they involve genetic counselors and genetic counseling uh, in this space. Next slide, please. So the, the really important takeaway of these, these projects is um, because they are focused again on identifying and caring for these individuals and improving their outcomes, it's, it's, not, it's multi level. So all of these projects um, focus on uh, multiple or all of the, the levels, the, the patient level, the provider level, the system level, because we all know that this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, and so some of these projects, um, go ahead and click please. Um, so we've got a number of projects around family history collection or risk alerts. Um, those involve automated EHR extraction from the electronic health record, web-based portal tools, tablet tools, patient portal tools. There are projects on um, that augment genetic counseling processes. So we've got telehealth, e-health education, um, projects on linguistics and culture, like how do we actually uh, talk to individuals um, and do our de delivery of genetic counseling, um, especially to underserved populations. Um, there's chatbot work, decision aid work going on. Um, there's also projects that are specific to proband and cascade testing, uh, as well as uh, projects focused on prevention and early detection. Next slide. And you can see those if you go to um, the Moonshot uh, website um, specific to the prevention and early detection. Uh, now this will show you, it has links to the, the 12 funded Moonshot out of those, the, the 12 projects out of the RFA, but it also goes to the related events and, and can keep you up to date on, on all of the Moonshot um, things that are going on. And I have a link to that um, in one of the slides at the end. Go ahead, next slide. But what I wanna show you is of those 12 originally funded um, RFAs, uh, I just wanted to give you a example. Here's just eight of their titles of those first 12. So you can see kind of how they span the gamut related to genetic counseling and what we do. Um, so everything from new models of care, how do we test, population genetic screening for hereditary cancer syndromes, um, randomized trial of, of e-health delivery, so and caring for individuals who have been identified with hereditary cancer syndromes. Next slide. And along with the um, collaboratory and all of those 38 investigators and our teams uh, getting together and, and ensuring that we know what everybody's doing and, and trying to collaborate, uh, they've built this collaboratory so that we can um, hopefully learn faster and better in this space. And so in addition to these funded studies, we've also built this collaboratory um, where we have some work groups going on. And so I'll talk a little bit about the work groups as well. So our work groups are around data elements and measures. Uh, so again, we can make sure that um, we identified common data elements across a number of the earlier studies, establish recommended formats for data collection so that studies coming up behind us can, can use some of those formats. We can make sure that we can and um, compare data across projects. Um, there is an automated um, work, automation work group for pretest pre, pre genetic testing interventions. Um, and through that working group, we're establishing reporting guidelines for genetic counseling intervention tools. Again, because we identified a need as all these projects are coming up in order to implement something, we need to know what, how it was implemented. We need to know more than just here's, you know, how many people you, you actually ran this intervention on, right? So um, that's the charge of the automation working group right now. Uh, next slide. 
There's also a communication and messaging working group that published a um, manuscript or working on a manuscript across to show all the measures across some of the early projects so that again later projects or as more more folks are doing this work you can see what measures have been used we can standardize across projects and and new upcoming projects so again we can learn better and faster um, there's also in the works demonstrating some clinical scenarios so you can see what these look like um, as well as making recommendations for measures um, and then there's also this publication recently on um, a motivational interviewing uh, framework that's come out of that working group next slide please along with the working groups the we uh, investigators and teams also participate in webinars. Um, and so you can see a number of these uh, webinars and other, other events that have happened. Um, so our own Debbie Cragen was part of the webinar in 2021 on the effects of racism in research on inherited cancer syndromes. Um, I did a fireside chat implementation science fireside chat in 2020 on the impulse project again that's the implementing universal lynch syndrome project um and then kim kafink and her group talked about um the informatics to identify and manage eligible uh patients eligible for genetic evaluation of cancer risk so that's their the the first out of the rfas funded moonshot and i put there, um, I know there's genetic counselors on all of the other teams as well, but I wanted to highlight that while um, Wendy Coleman and, and Rachel Chambers were not our, uh, were, I, were not speakers on that webinar, they are, Wendy and, and Rachel were our, our main, main people in those projects. And again, so genetic counseling and genetic counselor presence in these moonshots, um, Hopefully more of you are out there who are, who are part of this um, and part of these projects. Genetic counselors are playing a big part and a big role in these projects. Uh, and then the um, approaches to the blue ribbon panel recommendations was a two day conference prior to the RFAs being released where Heather Hample and me and others were part of this uh, two day conference originally talking about how do we guide NCI in um, putting money, putting forth the recommendations to operationalize those recommendations from the Blue Ribbon Panel Report. Um, and so hopefully you can see we're, we're starting to do some, we're, we're really starting to do that a few, five years later. Go ahead, next slide. Um, and so one of the other recent things that we did is there's another set um, there, there's more inherited cancer work going on besides just that that's specific to the moonshot. And so recently the moonshot group um, also had a joint meeting with, there's three studies funded under another program called the Traceback program, which is specific to ovarian cancer. Um, and so the three traceback projects um, of which uh, we do have one um, for one ovarian cancer traceback at Geisinger as well. So I was also a part of this. And then three of the new, um, the new moonshots got together and talked about how there's overlap between the moonshots and the tracebacks and what else can we do again to move this work forward faster um, and really discussing those opportunities for, uh, again, more strategies for provider and, and patient communication to consider um, reaching out to probands, timing of these interventions to identify individuals with hereditary cancer, Again, education across our projects. What are we learning um, about genetic testing and genetic counseling, as well as the ethical and legal barriers of which there's a lot of that work going on in the traceback side, but is also very much um, related to what's going on in the moonshot projects. So again, trying to make sure that we're doing an awful lot of work in this space and that it's really relevant to genetic counseling and genetic counselors. Next slide. So um, you may have noticed some themes across these moonshot projects. And again, as I've probably said a number of times already, um, you know, lots of genetic counselor involvement, genetic counselors are leading big portions of some of these projects. Um, 
PIs on a couple of them, uh, the principal investigator on, on them, um, all the way to, to leading the genetic counseling interventions and everything, um, really uh, researching and helping ha determine how we deliver uh, and test these new models to improve care. Um, genetic counseling practice tools are being um, tested. The chat box, family history collection, new care models, and then, of course, a huge thing is implementation and implementation science, um, which is really just hopefully helping us learn better, faster, providing those frameworks and strategies for implementing these things later uh, and helping us focus on the context, those multi-level factors, patient level, clinician level, um, system level factors that will lead to real world implementation and sustainability, um, as well as collaboration and, and doing the work that's important to our patients and families and will really make a difference in their health. Next slide. So this is just an example of some of the recent publications that have been out. They're, they're everything from, you know, more um, just uh, descriptive or data presentation um, around patients meeting the testing criteria to uh, commentaries on universal cancer screening programs and genomic medicine programs. I put this up here mainly to get at um, some of the questions I hope we come up with in the discussion, um, which I invite you all to put in the chat while you're thinking about this and listening to uh, Heather's uh, part of this as well. Um, I think I have the questions listed on the next slide. Yes, yeah, so first, um, this slide is just the, the links for you all. So um, I don't know if the slides are shared afterwards, but there's the link to the uh, Moonshot pro pro program website, as well as one of the current RFAs that's still open is the Mentored Research Experience for Genetic Counselors. Um, and I believe this is what is the, the one program that's led by Heather Zierhut is uh, funded under this. Um, there was a genetic counseling process and practice a call for proposals that is now closed, but it does show that um, NCI has been in this hereditary cancer space and very interested in, in funding ways for genetic counselors to be involved in this work, knowing that they are a huge part of this, whether they are parts of the project team or whether they are the principal investigators. And because there's this big focus on implementation science and those of you that attended our um, workshop at the National Society of Genetic Counselors meeting. Um, I put here the links to the open access training course for um, dissemination and implementation research in cancer that you can get to as well. Next slide. So some of the questions I want you to think about from this, um, fr from uh, the, these moonshots and as more projects get funded and go forward in this space, um, or you yourself get the opportunity or to um, work on these projects or develop these projects, uh, or from the clinical standpoint, what, what is most useful when results from these projects are reported to help you consider or implement these new care processes in your own practice? What do you need to know? What do we need to report? Um, and what are most exciting about these projects and, and the moonshots to you and your clinic life? And what questions come up when you see the, the titles and the types of projects that are getting funded? So thank you so much. And now I'm gonna let Heather talk about um, the more recent stuff that came out from the, the Moonshot and recommendations. Thanks so much, Alana. Um, so what I'm gonna be focusing on is the um, February 2022 report from the President's Cancer Panel, which was entitled Closing Gaps in Cancer Screening. Um, if you have any questions, my email's on the bottom left of the slide. If you're still on Twitter, I don't know how many of us still are, uh, my Twitter handle is there as well. Um, next slide. Okay, so the purpose of this report um, was it was sort of to mark the conclusion of the National Cancer Act's 50th anniversary. And the focus was on improving uptake of cancer screening. And they particularly noticed uh, or, you know, noted the precipitous drop in um, cancer screening that occurred due to the pandemic, which made it even sort of more timely. So um, they, they mentioned that there's been underutilization of cancer screening before, um, 
which got worse um, during and beyond the pandemic, which is a problem that needs to be addressed. And they concluded that more effective and equitable implementation of the existing evidence-based cancer screening modalities and guidelines represents a significant opportunity to reduce the burden of cancer and accelerate decline in cancer deaths. Um, so this report, which was released in February of 2022, and the uh, URL for the report is um, on the right side of the screen below the front page of the report. Um, what it was generated from following a series of events that were held in 2020 through 2021 on cancer screening with a focus on breast, cervical, colorectal, and lung cancers. Um, and I will just tell you um, on the next slide what my role was. Oh. So um, the colon cancer screening meetings um, took place in uh, January of 2021. And I was invited to attend them. It was a two-day meeting by webinar because of, of COVID. And I think it was because of my work on the National Colon Cancer Roundtable that I got invited to attend the first two-day meeting, which was sort of just discussion and fact-finding. Then I was, as you can see on the acknowledgments page from the report, one of the reviewers of early drafts of the report. To my knowledge, I don't think any genetic counselors were invited to the meetings on breast, cervical, or lung cancer screening, um, which is, of course, uh, particularly unfortunate for breast, which has a huge hereditary component. Next slide. Um, so the outcome in the report was um, broken down into four goals. Um, it's an 84 page report in, uh, in its entirety. Um, the four sections you can see here on the left. Um, so they break into general categories of improving and aligning communication, facilitating equitable access, strengthening the workforce collaborations and creating uh, effective health IT. I'm going to talk today about goals one, the one in green and goal three, the one in red, since they have relevance to genetic counselors. Next slide. So the goal of improve and align communication had, um, as you can see in the second bullet there, um, a um, target of creating and expanding national cancer roundtables. So this is the um, roundtable um, that I was referring to that I've been on. So the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable um, was co-founded by the American Cancer Society and the Center for Disease Control in 1997. It's the first um, roundtable uh, of this type. And it has a primary goal of increasing colorectal cancer screening rates among eligible US adults. This, these roundtables are, um, the members are organizations, not individuals. Um, so when they reached out to me in 2013, what they were asking for is a representative of the National Society of Genetic Counselors on the roundtable, because again, it's a, a, it's a group of organizations, not individuals. This group has been hugely successful. They had a very large campaign called 80 by 18 or 80% 80 by 2018 with a goal of getting all eligible adults um, compliant with the colorectal cancer screening guidelines in the general population um, by 2018. And this was very, very successful. Um, and there were spots where it, um, it didn't succeed. And so once that campaign ended, we're in the middle of the next campaign, which is 80% in every community. So making sure that that's across the board. So they reached out to me in 2013 because they were getting more and more involved in um, family history and early onset work and recognized the need to have genetics expertise at the round table. Um, so I have been the NSGC liaison to the NCCRT since 2013. As I mentioned, I also served a four-year term in the steering committee for the NCCRT, and I am the co-chair of the Family History and Early Onset Task Group. And this, um, I think, is really important to have genetic counselors at these tables. And again, I wouldn't have been invited to the president's uh, cancer panel meetings on colorectal cancer screening had I not been involved in that group. So ACS has since partnered with many organizations and companies to form additional roundtables. And so the other three that exist currently are HPV vaccination, that's been in effect since 2014, 
patient navigation since 2014 and lung cancer since 2017. But as a direct you know, outcome of this report, which called for creating and expanding national cancer roundtables, they are now developing a roundtable on breast cancer, which will be called the National Breast Cancer Roundtable or NBCRT, and a cervical cancer um, roundtable. And they're calling that one nat the National Roundtable on Cervical Cancer, or else it would have the same acronym as the uh, National Colon Cancer Roundtable. So that one's NRTCC. Um, so I reached out actually um, prior to this talk to check with the NBCRT to see if they had genetics representation. And they um, responded today and let me know that they're really just getting started. And they're at the point where they're beginning their membership recruitment process. And they do in fact want um, membership from both the National Society of Genetic Counselors, but also the Minority Genetic Professionals Network. Um, and so I am connecting them with NSGC leadership and MP, uh, GPN leadership so that they can get genetic counselors on that panel because, of course, family history and genetics is a huge component of breast cancer. You could argue, you know, that some cervical and lung cancers are also hereditary. I don't think it's as large of a component um, and uh, not sure whether or not we need genetic counseling representation on the other two roundtables. Um, but I put the uh, URLs for NCCRT and for the new emerging NBC. RT at the bottom of the slide, um, and any cancer genetic counselors who sort of um, consider themselves um, really interested or expert in hereditary breast um, cancer, uh, who might be interested in becoming the liaison for NSGC to um, the National Breast Cancer Roundtable can please reach out to me because it, uh, this is really important and it makes sure that genetic counselors are at the table. Next slide. Um, so now I'm going to move into the, the third goal of the President's Cancer, Cancer Panel um, report, which had a lot of genetics in it. So this was the goal around strengthen workforce collaborations. And you see they specifically call out in the second bullet expanding access to genetic testing and counseling. Uh, the first bullet actually also has to do with genetics, um, as we'll talk about in a minute, but that's empowering healthcare team members. And I just loved that on this figure from the report, you see they specifically have genetic counselors drawn out um, as a member, an important member of the healthcare team. And so I thought that was um, um, great. Next slide. Okay, so um, they have a beautiful infographic about um, the increased cancer risk for, with um, inherited mutations in um, cancer susceptibility genes. The top line was Lynch syndrome, and they've got the general population cancer risk for those four cancers um, noted on the infographic, and then the increased risk if you have Lynch syndrome, and then in the bottom uh, row, the um, uh, general population's risk for those four cancers and the increased risk with a BRCA gene mutation. So you see that they are uh, quite serious about um, including access to and identification of individuals with hereditary cancer syndromes. Um, so they specifically kind of in the beginning of this section um, say that they support assessment of eligibility for germline genetic testing for all people diagnosed with cancer. And they note that currently most people with mutations in cancer susceptibility genes are never identified or are not identified until after they are diagnosed with cancer. Uh, they also call out cascade testing. They say if variants of concern are identified, cascade testing of family members should be offered. And they say that providers should regularly co collect thorough family and personal health histories to determine whether patients should undergo genetic testing for cancer risk genes. And that the collection of this information should start before age 25 so that genetic testing can be recommended in any supplemental screening initiated according to guidelines. So I think this is important for all of us to know. These They're telling us what they find to be important. And if you're thinking about applying for grants, these are topics that Im improving these topics um, and, and citing the President's Cancer Panel report, um, you know, would, would, I think, go a long way in your grant applications. And it's just really nice to see that they have us on the radar. Next slide. Um, so then they go into a whole section about education and training for healthcare teams. And so they really um, say that 
all members of the healthcare team must have the knowledge and skills to recommend and discuss appropriate cancer screening. And they include cancer genetics in this sort of broad umbrella of cancer screening. Um, so they said, although the depth of knowledge varies depending on their role, all members of the team should learn about, and you'll see um, several of these have to do with genetics. So the first is cancer risk assessment, including the role of pathogenic variants in cancer susceptibility genes shared decision-making, including discussion of the benefits and potential harms of cancer screening and genetic testing, cancer screening modalities and guidelines, including benefits and potential harms of screening, um, management of screening results is when I think, has the, unless you include genetic testing here, has the least to do with genetic counseling, a role of stigma and inherent bias in healthcare and strategies to overcome them, the importance of cultural competency, effective use of telemedicine, um, which they do call out specifically for genetics here in a minute, and functioning as part of a team. Um, so again, here, I think they're telling us that any efforts that um, people are interested in doing that would help train all members of the healthcare team on cancer risk assessment and um, hereditary cancer syndromes um, are important and would be supported. Um, so I, I think this is good. Next slide. And it's really a segue to, to this um, next part of the guideline we can forward, which is um, that we should not, so there's three targets in this area. And one is um, do not restrict who can order genetic testing. Um, so um, as many of you on this call are aware, there are some uh, insurance companies that um, have policies that required that a patient have genetic pre-test genetic counseling from a board certified genetic counselor or geneticist prior to getting cancer genetic testing. Um, they uh, specifically say that uh, payers should eliminate requirements for pretest counseling by a certified genetic counselor or medical geneticist, and that all providers should be enabled to offer genetic testing with informed consent. Um, I will say NSGC is actually supportive of this change. Um, we, we were never trying to restrict who could order genetic testing as long as they um, feel confident that they can get an appropriate informed consent. And um, they did note here that it would allow certified genetic counselors to focus on patients with the highest need, particularly those found to have pathogenic variants in cancer susceptibility genes or complex genetic situations. Um, so I think, you know, this is really the setup for a lot of the mainstreaming of genetic testing that's going on already across the U.S. as um, we're increasing the scale and, and, and of, of testing and the numbers of patients who need testing and maybe moving the informed consent into the oncology setting and handling the post-test counseling for positives or negatives or VUS patients with um, significant or concerning family histories. Next slide. Uh, target two, increase genetics training and workforce. So this, you know, in their overall part of the section was, was pretty clear, but they actually say that training and residency programs, professional societies and guideline makers and other organizations should expand opportunities for training and education on genetics, genetic testing, and interpretation of genetic test results. Um, they uh, specifically call out well-designed clinical decision support tools, um, and you may have noted in some of Alana's um, a presentation about moonshots that are currently funded, some of them have to do with um, finding high-risk patients in the electronic medical record, um, best practice alerts. All of these are clinical decision support to make this easier for um, frontline uh, providers to be able to identify patients who are at risk, get them referred to genetics or get their testing and referred to genetics after they uh, test. Um, so um, importantly, they say providers should have established relationships with genetic counselors so that timely follow-up appointments can be made for patients with complex results or additional questions. Um, so they, you know, even if these providers are going to offer testing themselves and use these clinical decision support tools, they need to have a, a, a pre-established relationship with a genetic counselor so they know where they're going to send their patients to when they have questions or test positive. They mentioned specifically that the demand for genetic counselors is high and will undoubtedly increase as the rise in availability and uptake of genetic testing for various diseases increases. 
Um, they um, call out the Interorganizational Genetic Counselor Workforce Working Group and um, implore them to continue their work to ensure that there's a robust and well-trained genetic counselor workforce available to meet the needs of patients in the emerging genomic era of medicine. And here's where they said specifically that counseling via telemedicine should be used as needed to increase access in rural and remote areas and avoid delays based on availability of in-person appointments. Um, so really, I think they do, um, they are aware what's going on in cancer genetics and they know that finding these patients that are at high risk based on having a pathogenic variant and cancer susceptibility gene so that they can get appropriate management and don't follow general population management is critically important. And next slide, um, and perhaps the most exciting, they specifically say um, that CMS recognition of genetic counselors um, is important and will increase access for um, patients to genetic counseling, particularly Medicare patients. So they say legislative changes should be made so that we are recognized healthcare providers by CMS. They mention the Access to Genetic Counselor Services Act, which is ha has been introduced to both the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Um, they urged Congress to take up the issue and amend the Medicare program to provide direct coverage of services provided by genetic counselors. And it's important to note out of all of the recommendations in this 84 page report, this is the only recommendation that requires legislative action. Um, so we have tried um, and NSGC has tried um, to point this out. Um, we've had meetings with the White House since the report came out, um, meetings with legislators as we um, got more co-sponsors for the bill, um, just letting them know that um, Basically, the president and his panel of experts specifically have recommended that um, CMS provide recognition of genetic counselors. So uh, I think this is very exciting and important. Uh, we will know very soon within the next week whether we might our bill might get included in an end of year legislation package. Um, we should know that by the 23rd. If we don't get through in an end of year legislation package, we will be able to reintroduce the bill into both the House and Senate very quickly in 2023. And most of the um, current sponsors and co-sponsors um, did earn a new term. Um, so they will um, probably quickly, uh, that momentum that we have will we'll switch over to the next um, uh, cycle. Um, and for those of you who haven't yet there, you know, please contact your um, representatives and senators if um, you can and let them know that um, this is very important um, for patient access to um, cancer genetic services. And I think that's my next last slide. Yep, thank you very much. Um, and hopefully, yeah, we've got plenty of time, Alana, um, for some discussion and q and I don't know if we wanna start with um, Q&A and then maybe we can bring up those discussion, discussion questions you had at the end of your talk. So um, we, at this point in time, you know, if anyone in the audience has any comments, anything they would like to further talk about, any questions for us, please feel free to put them either in the chat itself or in the Q&A box. Um, in the meantime, I can actually scroll over uh, back to those questions that you had um, so we can all kind of take a look at them at the screen too. Oh, okay. And it looks like um, Shudika typed them in the chat. So that's great. Oh, so okay. people can see them there too. All right. Um, so we do have one question. I think this would be great for um, both of you to kind of, you know, answer for us. But, um, you know, Heather, what you were just talking about for the last portion. So, you know, besides signing the letter regarding the access to, you know, Genetic Counselors Act, is there anything else that an individual GC can do to kind of really help push these initiatives, you know, further and forward? Um, yeah, that is great. I um I've been working on it very hard the last couple of months. And um, some of the things that cancer genetic counselors are uniquely positioned to do is um, we all have state chapters of ASCO. Um, for example, in Ohio, it's called the Ohio Hematology and um, Oncology Society. And what we've been doing short of getting ASCO to sign on as a supporter of the bill is to get all of their state organizations to sign on um, so that we can go maybe to ASCO and say, hey, 
all of your state organizations are in support of this bill. Maybe the national organization could sign on as well. And we're actually at 60%. Um, which is remarkable. So um, because I still live in Columbus, Ohio, I um, got the Ohio um, group to sign on, uh, but I work at City of Hope in Southern California. So I got the Southern California um, organization to sign on as well. If um, you can reach, I literally just Googled them and found the email of the president and emailed them. Um, there's information actually on the NHGC's website that you can include or reach out to me and I can send you my emails and my attachments that I sent. It wasn't hard. Uh, I had to pester a few of them a few times, but they, um, you know, cancer genetic uh, oncologists really value um, having cancer genetic counselors and know that the majority of our patients are in fact on Medicare. Um, and so this is critically important and they've been huge supporters. ACS CAN is actually one of the organizations that's also signed on in support of the bill. So um, if you want to check to see if your state Hemonc Society has signed on, and if they haven't, try to get them. I think that's low-hanging fruit. I would do that. Um, if you haven't met with your um, representative, um, again, why don't you email me and I'll connect you with um, uh, John Richardson and the office. They'll set up a meeting. And the tricky is you have to have a genetic counselor who lives in the rest representative's district to get one of these meetings. You can't, like, I can't, there's some people we've been trying to get um, because they're on important committees. So um, Representative Payne um, in New Jersey is on an important committee, but we cannot find a genetic counselor who lives in his district to go to a meeting. I go to the meeting, but they don't really care what I have to say because I don't live in the district. So um, if you haven't and are willing to do this, they are not scary. You do not talk to the actual representative. You talk to their health aide, who is generally a 25-year-old um, hip cool person who is open to hearing about, you know, what we say. I, I was on one with the um, representative from the Toledo area and one of our genetic counselors from Toledo was on as well. Um, John joins, I can join, but we definitely need someone from the district. And, you know, he was really nice. And he just said, listen, until you've got a score, a CBO score that shows your cost saving or cost neutral, my representatives, uh, he ran on a, 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 a campaign of fiscal responsibility. So he doesn't support anything till he sees a CBO score that's neutral or saving. So you don't win them all, um, but it, we're trying to get a CBO score. And if it's neutral or savings, he's going to be the first person I email because they'll, you know, essentially said they'd sign on and support if we did. Um, and some of them uh, I had have again had success both in Ohio and uh, with Troy Balderson and in Southern California with Judy Chu. Uh, the meetings go a long way, actually more than the letters. Um, so if you're willing to do those, let us know. It's a critical time right now because the hope is it gets thrown in with one of these huge omnibus end of year legislations. This is when PAs got CMS recognition a couple of years ago, that's how they got it. Their bill got thrown in. It's a great question and, and it doesn't take that much time. And if we all spent, if we all gave it one hour, <laughs> I can't imagine what we could do. Colleen Campbell in Iowa, by the way, is the head of the advocacy committee um, and is doing a great job. She also knows specifically which um, Hemonc societies have and haven't signed on. So um, if you know her or want to loop her in, that's a good way to, to find out. All right, perfect. And um, we did have a few other questions just come through the chat. So uh, the answer to the first one is that this presentation will actually be posted in 48 hours on um, YouTube and the NHGC website. So the slides and all of that will obviously be included on there. Um, and then our next question is, can you provide an update on ACMG position relative to the president's recommendation with regard to restricting testing and CMS recognition? What are the barriers we are facing in legislation approval? Um, you know, I think we need a CBO score, it would help. Um, because if we were shown as cost savings, they would throw us in end of year packages to offset other pet projects that do cost money. Um, and we don't have a CBO score. Um, so if anybody has, I'm, I'm told that um, energy and commerce and ways and means basically um, more than the actual committee members that are representatives, but the, the people who run those committees can most effectively lobby to get us a CBO score, a Congressional Budget Office score. Uh, I think that would help a lot. Um, Otherwise, we're just trying to get more co-sponsors. And the usual life of one of these bills is it just 
takes years. And if you, I just saw a graph, I just came from an NSGC meeting and we have been going steadily up. We have 65 co-sponsors on the House bill right now and seven in the Senate, which is the most we've ever had. And if you look at the trajectory over time, I know it feels like we've been trying to do this for a decade now. And I used to get so frustrated too, but it just takes time. Um, and so we're in a really good place. Uh, would be really great if it got included in an end of year package. And this president's can cancer panel thing really gave us some good momentum this year. Yeah. And Alana. speaking to your timing, Heather, remember Gina took what, 13 years? That's right. That's right. Okay, perfect. And so we do have another question where um, this individual says, so these moonshot projects are really exciting and it would be interesting to try to implement a project. Um, they think that the biggest challenge would be getting institutional buy-in to support a project that might actually address service delivery models. So the question is really, are there any suggestions or tips for this? Um, yes, I, I can say. Um, so that is one of the reasons why we we um, have the um, automation working group where we're talking about um, putting forth some things about things, uh, what people should be reporting on these interventions so that they give you that information of how they got institutional buy-in. Um, the other one is our, our impulse project. The point of the impulse project was actually to look, which is the one on implementing universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome. Um, our goal was to look across institutions that had and have not, and everything in between, implemented programs to understand how to get, you know, how, you know, what, what are those key difference makers to help get these uh, get the the tumor screening implemented uh, using Lynch Center basically as a use case of how to do this, and um, so we've we we've created a toolkit. It's going to live on the Lynch Center uh, screening network website. Um, and it does have an economic modeling tool. Again, it's specific to the different ways that you could do Lynch syndrome screening, but one of those is like direct to germline testing. Um, it has the, the background math is of course specific to um, Lynch syndrome cases, but we've also had genetic counselors that have used it um, as a way to just start that conversation. They can say, look, you know, we do direct to germline for just look, endometrial and colon cancer patients, this is the cost per patient, can we try it on everybody or whatever, um, you know, so they've used that to start their conversations. And again, our toolkit um, that is, again, for Lynch syndrome right now, um, but we, we hope really Lynch syndrome is just the um, use case for this toolkit, really walks through like, where, where is your organization in the process, um, do you have something? Do you have people who are involved? What are your attitudes um, culturally in your organization to this? Um, or what do you, and, and depending on where you are, then what steps can you take to get that buy-in? What steps do you need to, what, what economic um, proposals do you need to make to them to show them which workflows might work? Um, do you have the internal, um, structures to do one better than another? Um, do you have your champions? How do you find them? Those type of things. And I was just rereading Jane's question. I don't think I answered it properly. If so, if I could just go back to that one. I think she was talking specifically about the ACMG position relative to our bill. Uh, which has been problematic. So um, for those of you who aren't aware, the American College of Medical Genetics uh, does not support our bill unless we add a supervision uh, component, which would say that we are supervised by a physician, uh, which would sort of defeat the entire purpose of the bill, which is that we can see patients in bill by ourselves. Also, supervision is supposed to be handled in state licensure bill bills, not in a federal CMS recognition bill. So the whole idea is a bit misplaced. Um, the organization is under uh, has new leaders this year. I don't know if they've warmed up in their position at all. Um, uh, but certainly if you are involved in the organization, it, uh, they did not pull their membership to see if the membership felt this way. And, and we are aware that a good portion of the membership does not agree um, with their stance. And so um, anybody who um, is involved in ACMG and can let them know that this is really not the place to handle supervision requirements. 
um, and that this is really for the greater good of patients and getting them access to genetics, I, I think is the really key piece. I have been told that is actually not causing us a huge barrier to getting the bill through. Um, they are a small organization and nobody, and for example, the AMA has come out with any concerns about the bill, which would be much more difficult to get the bill through. Um, but if we had a very large medical group like ASCO who signed on in support of the bill, it would certainly outweigh a very small organization who may have a problem with the bill. So this is, again, another part of the strategy to see if we can get as many of the ASCO state organizations on so that we can maybe get ASCO to sign on. All right, thank you for answering that. And um, we, uh, oh, it looks like we just got, oh, so it was, uh, they said thank you for your involvement in advocacy um, and uh, they have to sign off. Um, I guess one of the questions that I have myself, so I am not a cancer genetic counselor. I work in a primarily pediatric and adult genetics clinic. Is there anything more specifically that the other counselors who are not working directly in cancer genetics can do to kind of help further these initiatives or to even just find out you know, more about them since it's not something we deal with you know, more on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I think um, all of us can um, uh, get involved in meetings with our representatives or senators, health aides regarding the access to genetic counselor bill, whether you do cancer or not, for sure. You can, um, if you didn't at NSGC, when Heather Zierhut, um showed the QR code to write the automatic letter to your represent 1600 people actually in that one meeting um, within an hour <laughs> signed on to the letter um, asking it to be included in end of year legislation. I'm trying to post it right now, but I don't seem to have access to the everyone in the chat. Um, so I sent it to Shrutika. We'll see if we can get it posted or if not circulated after the word. They've made it so easy. Literally just take a picture of the QR code, put in your address, it, um, and then it sends the letter automatically drafted to your representative and your senator. Um, so I can't stress that enough. And there are lots of other organizations that um, if you have professional organizations in your peds or pre prenatal group that haven't signed on in support, every, you know, it would be great to get ACOG to sign on, right? Um, and so um, uh, yeah, these same things basically apply, but just to your professional organizations, whatever you can do. Alana, any other? advice? Yeah, so I will go on the um, speaking from the the doing the the work, getting the interventions and the changing practice in there. Um, so on that side, in the other, like in prenatal and, and pediatrics, as you're testing new interventions, new new models of care, um, make sure you get it out there, use the same um, uh, ways of reporting it. Look for these guidelines on, on how do you report it. Report on those implementation outcomes. What worked, what didn't, what did you have to address at the organizational letter level, at the clinician level to get these things through um, and to change your practice to do telehealth, to do uh, to use chatbots in, in your area and what worked and what didn't. Um, share that because we can, we can learn from all of our different uh, areas of practice. All right, thank you. So um, it seems like we are approaching the end of the webinar. I don't know if there's anything else the two of you, um, you know, kind of wanted to add at the end. Um, otherwise, um, I can start to wrap up, but wanted to give you a chance. I just think it's a it's a very exciting. Um, sign um, that uh, genetic counselors and genetic counseling and genetic testing uh, seem to be being appreciated and funded by um, the NIH and the NCI, and hopefully it will just spread from here from cancer into all areas of, can of genetics, and um, especially when they see the amazing research and work we all can do. Absolutely. I can't say it any better. <laughs> All right. Well, perfect. So then um, to everyone listening. So this concludes today's uh, member webinar. And thank you very much to our two great speakers. On behalf of the NHGC webinar subcommittee, I wanted to thank you all for attending this webinar and for allowing our speakers to share their stories and experiences. This webinar recording will be posted to the webinar page of the NSGC website within 48 hours. 
CEU options for this webinar are available for purchase and will be available in approximately 72 hours following the live webinar. For more information, you can visit the NSGC website uh, on the webinar page for information on how to submit for continuing education credit. Have a great day. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>